Welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packo. Welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. And our guest today has been all over the world in a variety of uh, missions. And she has an extraordinary story about hardship, perseverance, faith, being put up for adoption at a very young age, all the way to eventually becoming the Surgeon General of the United States Army. Before we get to our discussion with her, we want to talk briefly with EWTN's John Elson about a new television series on the Reformation that is coming to EWTN. John, how are you doing? Well, good to be with you again. Thank you so it's, much. Yeah. It's nice to have somebody <laughs> live Real person. in the studio, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. and uh, 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 present yeah. here. Yeah, that's um, yeah. But we allow work, people who work here can that's come. Right. That's right. So yeah. what's this series about? Well, thank you. Uh, th we're very excited to debut next Wednesday, uh, May 6th at 10 p.m. Eastern, and mm -hmm. we'll re-air the first episode uh, the following day. Uh, May 7th, Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm. And this, as you said, is the series, original docudrama series called The Reformation. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as we know, a lot of our, our, our Catholic history has been uh, filled with misinformation and has become black legends. As mm -hmm. you know, we talked years ago after we debuted our Crusades, uh, original docudrama to present mm -hmm. the truth of the Crusades. We've also produced an original docudrama series on the Inquisition. Mm -hmm. To present the, the proper re understanding of that of that historical period, I just yeah. let the videos of that uh, mm. series on the Inquisition yeah. get borrowed by a man I just received into oh. the church. Praise God! And he's yeah. going to be a history teacher. He's oh, graduating wow. <laughs> college. Right. And he said, every one of my students has to watch this yeah, no, video. Praise God. Yeah. No, he was really excited. Well, so, and, we're, and we're equally excited about the Reformation because, as you know, that's filled with misinformation. Yeah. And what we've done is, beginning, as I said, next week, we'll premiere episode one. And what we're going to do is journey throughout history, uh, pre-Reformation pre history, to give people a real sense of what the, uh, the, this was a Catholic world that everyone was living in, mm -hmm. and also to correct the theological formulations and to give people a fuller understanding of Martin Luther of John Calvin, of Huldrych Zwingli, mm -hmm. of John Knox, Henry VIII, and also present counter-Reformation figures. So it's going to be a monthly do, journey. Do you have anything about St. Ignatius Loyola? And, and, uh, I was about, about <laughs> to mention the Jesuits led by St. Ignatius, our very dear, uh, you know, very, very dear St. Ignatius. So we're okay, very excited. Okay, then I'll watch. Yeah. Go ahead. So it's going to be a monthly debut. So we'll begin mm -hmm. episode one in May, episode two in June, and we invite viewers to journey with us uh, month to month with this great new content. All right, we have a little clip of it. Uh, let's take a look at that. It is important to note that the church continued from the time of Jesus and the apostles through the church fathers that adopted the word Catholic, the Council of Nicaea that ratified the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, and the councils of Carthage that collected and listed the books of the Bible. It was therefore the Catholic Church that proclaimed Christianity. In AD 410, Rome fell to the barbarians, and pagans blamed Christians because the decline and fall of Rome happened during their watch. In response, St. Augustine of Hippo wrote the City of God to illustrate that Christianity is no mere religion, but a fully ordered way of life, and explains how the Catholic Church can build a civilization based on the Gospel. Popes, bishops, and rulers found in this work the monumental blueprint for a true Christian civilization. Arguably, St. Augustine, along with St. Thomas Aquinas, are two of the greatest philosophers of Western civilization. Well, all right, we want you to watch this premiere episode of EWTN's original docudrama series, The Reformation, A Catholic World, beginning Wednesday, May 6th at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, and you can get your own DVD copy at EWTNRC.com. It will be item number HDTR1, HDTR1. Uh, John, yeah, thank you, Father. Thank you for you. getting that organized thank so you. we can have it. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes with tonight's guest, so please stay with us.
Welcome back. We have a guest tonight who was once an orphan with uncertain future, but her adoptive parents never let her take no for an answer. And despite having been ostracized for being a German Mischlingskinder or a, a, a mixed uh, race baby, a, a brown baby in the decades following World War II and during the occupation of Germany by the Allies, she went on to excel to unimaginable heights in her career as a leader, a medical doctor, and eventually as the 44th Surgeon General of the United States Army and Commanding General of the U.S. Army Medical Command. Joining us via Skype from Rockville, Maryland, it is very much my pleasure to welcome to the show retired Lieutenant General Nadia West. Nadia, how are you today? Well, hello, Father. Um, what an honor it is to be on your show here, and uh, I'm doing very well, thank you, here in, uh, in Maryland. Terrific. Well, actually, the honor is very much ours. We're delighted to have you on because I've listened to some of your talks from the past where you described your uh, parents, the parents that raised you here. Um, tell us how you got to meet them and a little bit about their own background because your parents are as fascinating as you and so much so that I think I know where you got the interesting part of your life from living with these very interesting people. Absolutely, Father Mitch. They are, uh, they are awesome, or they were awesome. And uh, there's no comparison in, in my life or accomplishments uh, to theirs. They were very humble people. Um, you may not have ever heard about them, but they were truly amazing human mm -hmm. beings. Um, and uh, have, again, each one of them, uh, we could spend probably you know, weeks on each one of their stories, but, uh, but you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, their, um, that I, I would say divine intervention, uh, put me, uh, in the same place that, uh, they were, um, and, uh, the rest is history. So, uh, you know, great, a great story for not only myself, uh, but my, uh, brothers and sisters and the hundreds of other children that they helped as well have, uh, totally different lives than they would have well, let's start off talking about your mother's background. I, her story is absolutely fascinating. Tell us how she moved along and eventually came to meet you. Well, my mom grew up in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Uh, again, a very humble family. Her dad was a, uh, a bellhop for the Arlington Hotel, which is still there. It was a resort uh, hotel in Mm -hmm. in uh, Hot Springs, and his uh, salary was based solely on tips that he would receive or sometimes not receive. Back then, you know, there was no minimum wage, and sometimes people were just not, um, you know, forthcoming with giving any tips to, uh, to um, the uh, people who worked there. And just imagine carrying these huge, you know, trunks and things upstairs, no elevators back then. So that was his life, a uh, very hardworking, humble man. Um, and her mom, also hardworking, she had, uh, there were seven kids in their family, and her, do her father died uh, when they were young um, of, uh, it sounded like a heart attack or something like that when he was a, a young person. And so she I grew mean, it up. Sounds, it sounds Sorry. as if he had been in the kind of work situation that we would have considered very unsafe today. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, like in hotels, you know, yeah, lifting, you know, um, I wouldn't, I don't know if it would necessarily be, um, unsafe, but, um, you know, working as a, uh, you know, back then in, in the 19, early 1900s, uh, you know, an African American working in a hotel, I mean, that's kind of the work that they could get. It's probably considered good work back then, uh, to be able to take baggage, um, to rooms of, uh, patrons at the hotel. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, again, not really a great income to raise a family of seven children, but right. uh, did well. And, um, and, and my mom, so my mom came from a background of very hardworking, um, you know, just uh, kind of salt of the earth, great folks that are just yes. doing the best they can to raise a family. And she herself was uh, raised 
like many African Americans in the South, uh, a Baptist. Uh, right. Yeah, that was uh, her background. Um, but eventually, there, there were some events that led to her becoming a Catholic. Tell us about some of that. Yeah, so um, so the, the part of the story which was really interesting, she used to tell us as a child that she was very sick when she was young. Um, and uh, it sounded like, based upon the description, that she had a condition called peritonitis, which is inflammation of the you know, abdominal cavity. Mm -hmm. And it was probably due to a ruptured appendix. She was probably like, you know, nine, 10. Um, that they, you know, what they thought of. And back then, you know, ruptured appendix, you, you know, that was a death sentence. Yeah. Um, they couldn't afford to take her to the hospital. They, um, uh, the doctor came and basically told her mom, her mom's name was Pearl May. So she said, you know, he said, Pearl, you know, don't call anymore. We can try to give her something for comfortable, but if you can't, if she can't afford surgery, well, couldn't get to a place to have surgery, um, she's probably not going to survive. So we'll just make her comfortable. And so my mom was uh, said her mother was not um, hearing any of it. So she was a, a woman of prayer herself. And my mom recalled while she was in this, um, you know, I guess, you know, unconscious or, you know, semi-conscious state that she saw this um, really kind of creepy looking thing coming towards her. And she said she was trying to scream and move. She was trying to call for her mother, but she couldn't. And then she said, then she saw this beautiful lady that had, a kind of necklace with beads on it um, come and, put, you know, sm she started smiling and then she, um, you know, the creepy thing went away. And then my mom's mother, excuse me, mother said that she said her eyes were like fluttered during that time and then she woke up and then she didn't know what that was. She told her mom about this lady. So they just thought it was okay, a delirium, you know, fever or something like that. So I tell that story to say fast forward years later um, when she, uh, was in the uh, D.C., Washington, D.C. area. She'd had, um, was going through some trials. My mom worked really hard. I mean, she, I mean, I got to tell you a little bit more about her. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but, Go uh, ahead. Yeah, so, yeah. so so, she and her sister, the, so she and her sister, after they left um, Hot Springs, Arkansas, went to Pittsburgh to put themselves through school. school. And she used to tell us about getting up in the morning, um, washing windows uh, before she went to school, um, you know, three and four o'clock in the morning, you know, freezing cold temperatures and um, whatever they t took. So she was really had a lot of spunk and um, just did whatever she needed to do. Um, and then she also uh, spent some time to get a degree in journalism and then worked at the Afro-American uh, newspaper, uh, which w is in Baltimore, Maryland, is when it was the headquarters, I believe. Um, and it's still in circulation today because, again, with segregation, they had, um, you know, black papers and or Negro papers, as they call them then, and then the regular papers. Mm -hmm. So that's what she was doing in the D.C. area. Um, and so she was going through rough times. And her brother was the, you know, my Uncle Billy was the pastor of Berean Baptist Church, again, here in D.C. And he said, for some reason, he told her, sis, you need to see a priest. And um, he even said later, he goes, I don't know what sees me to tell you to, <laughs> to see a priest. But she did, and they were, went to Holy Redeemer uh, Church in D.C., um, and this is, again, in the 1940s, 50s time frame. And she saw the statue of Our Lady there with the rosaries, and she said, that's what I saw when I was, you know, years ago when she was a kid. And so that was really kind of, gave me goosebumps when she told the story, because she had no reason to know anything about rosaries yeah. back where she grew up, and then that was something that, Years later, as an adult, she um, she found that, and yeah. so uh, it's just amazing and remarkable. Uh, you know, so folks would understand. You know, Arkansas was a missionary state for the Catholic Church. Maybe there were one percent Catholics there. Uh, you know, uh, most of the time, priests went there to take care of the few Catholics that had moved to Arkansas, but. They were not a big presence, so they, she just would not see Catholic images around her churches and such. That'd be very rare. So this uh, yeah. is all the more remarkable, to be sure. Right. As a matter so, of fact, I, I've heard of other children who, when they were small and had no background at all, would see Our Lady or our Lord, 
come to them in dreams. This, as a matter of fact, it still goes on in a number of places uh, that are Muslim dominated. And they find out that it's Jesus or Mary that came to them and it's a surprise to them. But that, that, that still happens. And you hear those stories being told uh, even to the present. Yeah, and so um, and so she was in Washington D.C. and then my dad was stationed at uh, in the Washington D.C. area at the time, and that's when they met in um, in the nineteen uh, late nineteen forties, early nineteen fifties, and now, um, so that just, was uh, just to explain what you mean by your dad being stationed there. Who stationed your dad there? All right, so that's the other story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my dad, another um, you know awesome human being, uh, was born in uh, in New Orleans, Louisiana, and uh, was a, you know he and a buddy joined the army actually in 1939, and part of it was he said because they you know they got a train ride to their first station, so he never been on a train before, so he thought that would be kind of neat, and plus you know just joining the military, doing something different. And at the time, the, the army um, was uh, segregated still then, and all the uh, what they called color troops were sent to Fort Huachuca, Arizona. And that's where they did their basic training. And, um, and he said it was really, and, and one of the things that really started him down the trail of, of really just having a love for the military, I mean, he stayed in for 33 years, so clearly he, he, um, he loved it. Uh, but he said, you know, even under the circumstances, and he, he didn't, you know, say it was great and lovely and, and all. Um, it was it was tough. But he said he really could see the the change of heart in the cadre, um, their cadre, or that's what they call the people who train uh, new soldiers. Uh, so the cadre were um, all white, and so initially they thought it was kind of a punishment tour. But then he said, as he as time went on, and they were training them, you know, teaching them how to march, teaching them how to shoot, and doing all the different things. He could see a change, you know, a softening of some of them that really um, came to respect them as their soldiers and took care of them as their soldiers. Just like in the army, there's a culture of, you know, we we as we, we take care of our soldiers. It's a family type thing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so he saw them kind of evolve into that, and uh, and it was really something that he said, okay, this is this is how you can change the world. It's one person at a time, having you know face to face uh, interaction with people rather than treating them as those people and not understanding, you know, who they are, what they are. Um, mm -hmm. And when you get to know people, it's really hard to keep your heart, heart hard, um, unless you're just really a hardcore, not a nice person. And so, but he said that it was really one of those things that um, he saw a future in the army and he, he saw a way to, to, for society to evolve. And um, the, you know, 1942 when uh, President Truman um, you know, had the desegregation, you know, executive order. I, I and think just that was 47. 47, 47. Yeah, okay. 47. Yeah, 42 was so, still Roosevelt president. Sorry, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. with the, uh, with the um, uh, seg desegregation order. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, saw that that was kind of a way that the military was leading society in having the... Um, uh, uh, you know, a way forward of how to do things. And again, it wasn't it wasn't rosy all the way through. They had to they had to start and somewhere. And during the Korean War, that's what they saw when they had replacements of troops. You know, when they they started replacing troops, they didn't ask for white soldiers, colored soldiers. They asked for soldiers. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, in World War II, when he was uh, you know in, in the World War II era, he was in the Aleutian Islands. Um, you know, during that phase of it, in a um, uh, all black infantry unit, or predominantly black, again, during that time frame. And then uh, worked through his career from private. Uh, he made it to first sergeant. And then he was um, actually on a waiting list to join the triple nickel, which was the all black parachute unit, uh, the very highly decorated uh, paratrooper unit called the, you know, the 555th. Um, but uh, got accepted to warrant officer school during that time, and then he became a warrant officer and retired as a uh, CW4, Chief Warrant Officer 4, which at the time, and he retired in 73, was an extremely, um, uh, that was a, an extremely successful career, um, mm -hmm. starting in 1939 and then mm -hmm. staying for 33-plus years. And, and so, that's, so that's the station part, what I was talking about with when he met my mom. 
And, and one of the things I think that you highlight here is that your parents both live through different sides of this tremendous change in our culture. I, the, the racism that was instituted by the Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson, legalizing segregation, led to all sorts of laws that, you know, really not only offended the dignity of African Americans, but also deprived the whole nation of an incredible pool of talent and giftedness that was just shunted aside. And, you know, for your parents to live through that era and see that transition away, when, when your dad joined the military, it was illegal for companies with federal contracts to even hire African Americans. And all of that started changing. And th to see that the military was a means of that change was absolutely a, a tremendous thing. He, was, he wasn't just observing. Your father was one of those heroes who was part of making that change happen. <clears throat> and those of us who live today need to be very grateful as we see African Americans at all stages of government, business, arts, sports, all this integration has benefited the country. And to see your parents as part of that is, to me, an extremely important perspective for everybody to appreciate. Absolutely, and I could never, uh, I, I could never express how absolutely proud I am of them to persevere with such great attitudes um, during that time. When I look back, I mean, when you're a kid growing up, they're just your parents, and you right. know you don't think about it. Um, but to think back, <coughs> what they went through, and maintain such a, you know, a pleasant, you know, you know, just. It, it, they didn't dwell on it. They talked about it, but not in a way that, you know, it was like, you know, fair, unfair. And that's kind of where they had that that attitude, you know, don't look at it being fair, unfair. It, it's what it is. You try to, you know, uh, change it where you can. But while you're trying to change it, you got to keep moving and you just got to keep working and, and doing the best you can. And that was the example they showed me and my older brothers and sisters. Um, you know, they're just incredible. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I'll bet you heard growing up from people who did that is stop that whiner, I'll give you something to whine about. <laughs> did they ever say that to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they sure did. They, yeah, they yeah. sure did. Because you know? they weren't whiners uh, and they weren't going to put up with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that was, it was like, no, that's like, gosh, you know, you can't get a break. Come on, you know, you're supposed to feel sorry for me. It's like, no, I don't feel sorry for you. Just keep going. Get up. Exactly. You know? and, uh, exactly. And so it's, uh, but it was it's in a good way, in a loving way. And yeah. it was just really, um, you know, something that kept us motivated. And, uh, you know, my brothers, and, you know, my brothers and sisters and I, and, um, you know, so, so that's what, you know, my, my parents, again, I, you know, of course it's when you say you owe them everything um, that can be sound so, you know, pro forma to say, but yes, I, I really do. Um, again, not only just because they, um, they selected me, you know, uh, you know, I wasn't an accident in their eyes. Someone else's accident ended up being something that they considered a treasure, which is really yeah. how they, how they treated us all. And so mm -hmm. it was just, now, just amazing to growing up in that family. So we've got a little bit of the background of your parents. Uh, I wanted to bring your dad's story into this because you were already mentioning how your mother, having you know, uh, met him already, and she went to see this priest in Washington where there was this statue of Our Lady with the rosary, and she said, that's the lady. That's the, you know. Now, now that we've got those two together... <laughs> and see what kind of persons they were. What, what happened with your mother at that point that she went to see that priest? So the, um, again, back in the childhood uh, condition that she had, um, 
she was not able to have children. So she probably had, you know, again, um, no medical records uh, to, to, yeah. to, to pour over to see in the late 19, um, late 1900s. Mm -hmm. But she uh, couldn't have children based upon that. So she had probably had scarring from the ruptured, you know, the, the, the scarring that occurs when you have, you know, um, uh, what's called purulent drainage, you mm -hmm. know, you know, the, the, inflammatory cells and the reaction uh, mm -hmm. just didn't allow her to have children. Sure. So she was, you know, that was kind of one of the things she was kind of feeling sorry for herself then. And that's when, you know, she also kind of got a wake up call where the, they said, Hey, stop feeling sorry for yourself. There's a lot of kids out there that you could, um, you could really uh, help. You know, they may not be your own, but you can, there, there's, there are kids out there to help. So that was kind of a wake up call, you know, for her as well, you know, kind of like you said, uh, stop your whining. You know, I'm sure that I'm sure they probably said it in a much more pastoral friendly way, but, but it, it hit home and she, she really, um, you know, she really understood, okay, that's something that I can do. And it was solidified for her when she visited, um, Lourdes, uh, my parents. So my parents got married. My dad was stationed in, uh, in Germany, um, because there, he was, so he was a logistician, Mm -hmm. um, a military logistician and a quartermaster as a, as a warrant officer. So they went to Germany, was stationed there. And so he would be in the field a lot. Um, and so she would take these, they were, they were things called American express tours. We could tour all over Europe. And so she would see, a, go to a lot of the holy sites. Um, she went to Lourdes. She went to see our lady of, um, Chester Stoa, uh, at a time when it was really dangerous. Cause you just think, you know, when they were over there in the early, late fifties, um, early 1960s. Yeah, Poland yeah, it was, was, it was still communist. Then. It, it was, and mm -hmm. and she was and funny. Dangerous. She said so. And a quick a quick side story: they were on the bus tour, and that was not on their list. And so she, and my mom, persuasive as she was, she said, "Please, Mister, I came all the way over here. I want to see the Black Madonna." And there, and he said, "Ma'am, you're going to get me. You know, and basically, you're going to get me killed. We're not supposed to go." And so she said, "She went. You know, they went there." And no one else wanted to get off the bus because there were soldiers there. And she said, I'm going to go and see it. And uh, she went and saw it. And nobody bothered her. And they were like, lady, you have no idea. And because they, they were like looking as if to say, "Who, you know, what's going on here? But she said it was just amazing. I mean, she didn't want to miss the opportunity. So she went uh, there. She went to Lourdes. And that's where she really had something come over her to say that there's more that you could do to help children. And mm -hmm. And that's when... You know, she, you know, met some the nuns in, in uh, Mannheim, Germany, that uh, started with my older brothers and sisters who, you know, uh, there was just one child there who had a friend, who had a friend, who had a friend. And then, uh, you know, um, so it was just one of those things. So my older brothers and sisters, there's a big gap between the ages. Uh, there were several that were all the same age. And so they, you know, when people looked at them, they're like, well, they're not triplets. I mean, there was one born on the 3rd of December, one the 6th and one the 5th of the same year. And so they didn't look anything alike. And they're like, you know, <laughs> really? These are, but they were friends and, you know, and my, my mom didn't want to, or my parents, both my, of course, my dad was part of the equation too, didn't want to kind of break up the band, so to speak. And so, yeah. <laughs> they, so and that was kind of, kind of neat, you know, with both my you know, brothers and sisters. Did those did those first siblings speak English? Um, I don't. Uh, they 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 were probably young enough that they could learn it. But no, they spoke uh, German. I don't right. know if they would have had right. um, any any um, any uh, part for that. In fact, um, uh, two of my brothers. So my older brother Peter, who's in one of the pictures, that was uh, you know he joined the army too. Um, uh, he and my brother Mac. When we came back from Germany, my mom uh, wanted to make sure they kept up their German and their Latin. And so at the Franciscan Monastery, I was telling you in D.C., we used to go to church there. There was a, a priest there that kept their German and their and their uh, and actually taught them Latin, too. Um, so they weren't happy with that at all. And they're like, man, why do I have to do this? But uh, my brother, Mac, actually uh, was really happy that he did because he went out. He moved out to Colorado and actually um, would uh, translate uh, journals and things for the library and actually was uh, picked to be like the escort if they had any, you know, German visitors or guests 
uh, you know, um, in, in the area. He was a park ranger, too, there in, in, uh, in, in Colorado. And so he was thankful that he was able to keep his German up and, and learn that, and my brother Pete, too. And let me, uh, were they also part African-American? Were they Michelin's kinder? Uh, yeah, all of us okay. were pretty much in, so, uh, in that. So yeah. here you've got these African-American kids, you know, uh, coming over here with a German accent. That, that must have been interesting. Look, we have to take a little break. We're going to come okay. back in a minute and maybe continue on from there. So please stay with us. We are continuing our conversation with retired Lieutenant General Dr. Nadia West, who is the 44th Surgeon General of the United States Army and Commanding General of the U.S. Army Medical Command. And we're discussing how her parents, having gone through a variety of difficulties, you know, uh, working through this segregated America, and her father being in the military and seeing those transitions. Her parents lived in Europe, in Germany, and started to adopt a number of children, including Nadia herself. Finish up talking about uh, your, your siblings, that your, your siblings were all adopted, correct? Right, Father, all of us. Um, so there's 12 of us that were adopted all together. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was one of those where, you know, my parents really didn't care about necessarily the race of the children. It was because mm -hmm. um, so all of us, you know, if you see us all together, none of us look alike or look the same. <laughs> and there's different, you know, different features and, and things. And so they just, you know, wanted to give kids um, some love. Uh, and, and one story, I have one brother that I never met, um, my brother Edward. Uh, was he died when he was nine in 1955 mm. of leukemia and the nuns asked him so at, at one point he had been adopted by a family and they realized he was sick and sadly they took him back to the orphanage and um, how tragic so my you know the nuns asked my mom do you have room for one more and mm. they said of course and so they uh, took him in and my mom said of course he was like a, a little angel Mm -hmm. And um, he died at uh, Walter Reed. Or it was then Walter Reed General Hospital back then, because uh, back then leukemia there really wasn't a lot that you no, could uh, no. do for it. And so he, um, um, so again, it was just they didn't care of the nationality of the child. Of you know, they tried, of course, help those that would be less likely to be adopted. Um, and of course, overseas in a in a European country, those. Um, you know, quote, brown kids um, would probably not be as desirable as, uh, as others. So they would, wanted to give any, any child um, a, uh, um, a uh, second chance or a sure. better, better life. Sure. And, uh, but so, the yeah. other thing is that not only did they adopt, what, 12 altogether? 12 of us, yes. Yeah, 12, 12 children they themselves adopted, but they also arranged for the adoption of other children to other families. Tell a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so uh, again, um, you know, my mom, once, once she was, uh, you know, once a fire was lit in her, in, her, uh, in her soul for that, she, you know, tried to take as many as she could. And then uh, she had some, you know, connections with her friends back in DC. Again, I mentioned she was in the journalism at the, with the Afro-American newspaper. Um, and just said, hey, are there, 
you know, there are kids here that could that need um, need homes, and you know, they may or may not be uh, adopted. Some of them were of American service members, uh, but some of them were not. They some mm-hmm. of them they didn't know the parentage of of the of the children, but mm-hmm. they just knew that there were a lot of kids and there were a lot of people who wanted to help or do something. And so uh, helped arrange adoptions uh, for for those. Um, and so she didn't run an agency or anything. It was not for pay or for anything like that. It was just by, you know, working with the nuns, working with, um, you know, uh, going through the proper, you know, channels and things. But uh, that was kind of one of the things that she uh, and, um, tried and to the help I- with. Yeah, and the idea was simply the kids need help. Let's do something. I and mean, she sounds like that kind of lady that I don't care about this, that, or the other thing. The kid needs love, and let's get him some. Right. Does that right. sound fair? Well, sa- well said, Father. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so well this said. is something that, um, it, as you, you started saying earlier on, that your parents, you know, are not, you know, well-known and well-famous and all. But they eventually got the notice of Pope St. Paul VI, as I understand. Yeah, they, they did. And that was, um, you know, because, you know, 19, I was seven years old. So when you're seven years old, you don't know what's going on. I remember having to get uh, my sister and I had matching coats. They're these red, white, and blue. You can't tell from the picture um, with a family standing there. But uh, they did get the humanitarian um, award from the, from the Pope. And interesting, I see a, a picture up uh, the the chaplain that has the patch with the what's called the Screaming Eagle. That's the 101st Airborne Division. That's mm-hmm. Major General um, Francis L. Sampson, who was uh, actually an, a prisoner of war initially. He jumped in, so he was a paratrooper. Jumped in um, on D-Day, and in um, he's actually a Knight of Columbus as well. Mm-hmm. And so he. He actually, uh, you know, was um, on the beach. Initially, landed in a farm, went to a farmhouse where they were. We had injured um, soldiers, uh, which was about to be overrun. And he, of course, as a as a young, as a young priest, um, stayed with the with the patients, the soldiers. He wouldn't mm-hmm. abandon them. Um, he was captured himself. And as the story goes, uh, they put him against a wall and were about to shoot him. And uh, he was so startled, he was going to say the act of contrition, but ended up starting in the prayer for uh, before meals, you know, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts. And uh, supposedly one of the German soldiers uh, recognized him as a Catholic priest and he was spared. Um, mm-hmm. Wow. And so, uh, and that's, uh, so that's, who would have known? And so here, back in 1968, here, this is a, a hero. Well, uh, um, as a matter it's of fact, unbelievable. It- I think we ought to mention also that a very famous movie, Saving Private Ryan, was based on a true story, and that right. chaplain was also involved in that process. Absolutely. He's the one who um, uh, the, that, that came to realize that the, uh, the one um, sergeant in his unit, um, I think Sergeant Island, I can't, I can't remember the name right now, um, uh, was uh, the last survivor, and so he wanted to have him sent back. And uh, I think the soldier protested, and he uh, reportedly said, "Well, take it up with with uh, Eisenhower, <laughs> you know, if you have a problem." <laughs> it was, and so yeah, and that's but it, that it didn't make it to the movie, but that was um, supposedly, um, you know, uh, a true story. On yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I'm sure. So, that, I'm sure. So that, this priest who was involved in saving Private Ryan. He was a prisoner of war, jumped out of a plane on D-Day into Normandy. Uh, just like, I don't know if you knew this, the former, uh, not, now he's passed away, but the uh, former uh, Archbishop of uh, New Orleans had also jumped on D-Day. And, oh, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> and when Katrina came, he was in his late 80s, and he's still going up in helicopters and being let down onto hospitals to give the last rites. I mean, these wow. guys, all that generation is just so amazing. But as um, this same priest then comes to play in 68 uh, with your family being honored by Pope St. Paul VI, correct? 
Right. And so he was the chief of chaplains at the time. So, um, you know, that's why and that the ceremony was at uh, the chapel at Fort Myer in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's amazing being in the D.C. area. And I, I would I would go to the chapel um, many a time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just kind of goose goosebumps that, you know, I, back then I was seven years old. There was one picture with the family and I think they were interviewing my mom or dad. And I'm, I'm there, you know, you know, chasing the shadow of the the cord on the microphone. I'm just looking at the, you know, trying to do like I'm like I'm doing a tightrope walk on the on the on the cord. You know, oblivious to all these things that are going on. So, well, so yeah, that was uh, that's amazing. This um, I, I'd and, like to jump off from here to talk a little bit more about your own. I mean, in so many ways, your parents who told you not to whine. Or they'd give you something to whine about. Uh, by the way, that I know that line, not because I know <laughs> your parents, because I know my parents. <laughs> and yeah. there was that the, they raised us right as far as that goes. And uh, you yourself, as you matured, you joined the military and went on eventually to medical school. Is that not correct? Right. And uh, again, from my dad's example, uh, my older brothers and sisters example, um, I mean, literally all of us except for two served. My oldest, the, the oldest sister, uh, Karen, who's, she's passed away now, um, she, she didn't join. But then that was early on where women weren't in the, in the, in right. the core. Uh, in the, and, uh, and then my brother who died of leukemia, he, he, of course, didn't join. But everyone else. So my sisters were wax. Uh, from the women's women's army corps yes. uh, way back when, so three of them were WACs. Uh, one of them was a WAF, and she was a women's auxiliary air force. Mm -hmm. And then my sister, next youngest to me, um, was uh, in the navy. So she joined the navy in '73, just as they were integrating um, the uh, service, where the the men and women sailors um, were in the same, you know, one 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 military. Right. And so. Um, so yeah, I was uh, I was I was hooked. My dad, the stories that he he gave uh, or he told us, and just his um, passion for serving our nation. I mean, he was a patriot. Uh, he mm -hmm. loved this country. I mean, even even in his old, you know, when he was much older, uh, when you know anything that came up, he wanted to be. Hey, I can still put my my mom was like Oscar. You know, you're <laughs> you've done your time, but he's like trying to find his uniform. It's like, come on, Dad, you know, <laughs> and so, uh, but he loved it because that was his, um, you know, he, and, and he loved the country and he said, it's your, you know, this is a great country, no matter what, warts and all, it's the best country in the world and you all should um, spend time serving it. And um, so he had his mini, you know, kind of a mini draft. I mean, he didn't force us, <laughs> but um, some of us stayed for careers. Some just did a couple of years and got out. But um, like my sister in the Navy, she retired as a master chief petty officer. So she was a, uh, reached the highest enlisted rank as an E9, mm -hmm. was in for 31 years. Um, my brother Peter that I mentioned to you, my the oldest, um, he was in, um, oh, I see the picture up. So Peter's the one that's sitting there. He's my oldest brother. And I remember taking him to, taking him to the school um, for show and tell in his uniform. I was in kindergarten here in DC. Um, but yeah, the one on the far left, my sister is from the WAF. And then the other three uh, are my sisters um, uh, that, that were WAX. And then that's Colonel Hoisington with the hat on. So she was like the, the head of the Women's Army Corps. She actually came to the, uh, the process. And of course, there's my dad, you know, that's standing there. Um, so he really did a phenomenal job of, uh, you know, um, really inspiring us, the, 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 the thought of serving our nation. Well, you yourself are a graduate of West Point. Is that not true? Right. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, and you did extremely well while you were there. I did okay, Father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Don't give me that false yeah. humility. <laughs> no, uh, seriously, no, but seriously, it's one where, you know, uh, I, I did, I mean, there's something where if you're at the top of your class, you're, you're called a star man or star woman. We were, were the gold stars. I was not a star woman. I did, I did well. I did okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's funny. That's me as a plebe in, in a French class. Uh, and, um, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> and then <laughs> bringing back memories. And then yeah. later on, you went on to medical school, correct? I did. 
Yeah. I uh, went to George Washington University uh, uh, here in uh, in Washington, D.C., Go Colonials. And uh, <laughs> that's their mascot, the Colonials. So, um, yeah, I went to medical school here and um, then went on to uh, serve as a, a physician in the, in the Army for almost Thirty-one years. So. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. No. It's, no. It's it's all a matter of history, and I'm I'm thankful. I'm I'm grateful to still be alive. You know, yeah. my kids kids laugh. You know, sometimes wondering, hey, did they have you know, did they have cell phones and computers back then when you were? <laughs> you know, so. No. So no, but it's settle it, down. <laughs> yeah. But you. But um, yeah. Again, before cell phones, you were deployed at Desert Storm. Uh, and uh, Desert Shield, correct? Yes, I was uh, attached to the, um, you know, it's no longer, it's, it's been deactivated, you know, but it was the 197th Infantry Brigade, mm -hmm. uh, which was a separate brigade of the 24th Infantry Division mm -hmm. and uh, out of Fort Benning, Georgia, mm -hmm. and I uh, was attached to the uh, 269 Armored Battalion um, during that time. And thankfully, uh, we didn't see a lot of casualties, but it was, yeah. um, it was a, uh, that was one of the experiences that made me, I think, stay as long as I did in mm -hmm. the military because you got to, you know, work with soldiers um, and you know what your role is to support soldiers. You know, that's right. why we exist as a as, as medical uh, medical officer in the Army Medical Department is to support our soldiers. Um, and of course, sailors, airmen, Marines, all of our services uh, and their families. Mm -hmm. And so uh, being able to work in that in that environment, we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, hindsight, sure. yes, it, it turned out well, but um, being able to work with our soldiers and those great medics um, mm -hmm. that, you know, men and women, the ambulance drivers that, uh, you know, were, were there and just youngsters, just really young. I was a captain then, so I was fairly young myself, but some of these young, you know, teenagers, uh, literally, you know, 18, 19 year olds that, um, you know, choose. It was, and it was, you know, I was in the volunteer service. It was all voluntary. They chose to serve their nation and take care of soldiers. Um, and, and, um, those that aren't the one that the picture that showed that was actually a, um, you know, an, a, an Iraqi. So it's not, we don't take care of just Americans. Once you become wounded, you're no longer a combatant and you're a, a patient in need of care. And so, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's no, um, None. And uh, no, no distinction. Eventually, it was a privilege and an you, honor to do that. You, you moved up from captain to the uh, officer corps to eventually become a lieutenant general, and to um, be the first African American surgeon general of the army. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing when I when I think about it. Um, you know, I had people like the the person there. I was being promoted to two stars there, and, and that's General Austin, um, the the gentleman with the four stars on the left that was uh, pinning the my my first promotion. You know, two star. Mm -hmm. um, he's uh, a hero. Uh, you know, Lieutenant General Lloyd Austin the third. Um, mm -hmm. If you Google him, look him up. Um, unsung hero. Uh, you know, one of the few um, African American four star generals. Um, mm -hmm. he recently retired, but, uh, one of, the, one of my mentors and one of the people I looked up to and is the reason I'm here today. Um, that's when I was promoted to surgeon general, my son on the left and my daughter on the right and, uh, here coming full circle. He's a cadet. Well, he was a cadet at West Point then he just, uh, graduated and is now a young Lieutenant, uh, artilleryman, uh, finishing up his field artillery, uh, course. Uh, that's at the Army Navy game when he was a plebe, uh, <laughs> which is a freshman. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's just amazing when uh, when you think about it. It gives me goosebumps well, to look at those. You well, know, uh, the thing that I think is key for understanding the the development here is your father joined a segregated military, stuck through it, through integration and through a transformation of the military, of his fellow soldiers, of the officers, the cadre, as you mentioned, that was training them. It was an ongoing transformation. And what your father believed in, in the 1930s about the military as a force of change 
came to fruition with you and many others who are you know, generals in the military. That is a real, uh, uh, an amazing difference. It's not that there are all the problems of race and segregation, all that stuff. Not everything is all done. But one of the things that you and your family give is a sense of hope that transformation does occur. And in the meanwhile, you maintain a humanity that serves others, as seen in the way your parents adopted 12 orphans and helped for the adoption of 5,000 others. I and mean, that combination of no whining, true loving service, and steady as she goes, transformation of society, all comes together in this life that's based on faith and the way our Lord and Our Lady directed you. Does that sound like a fair summary? I, I, I need to write that down, Father. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. you, you no, and I your think, parents think, are excellent. I think, and, yeah. well, um, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. And wow. it's been such a delight to be with you and hear these stories. And if I just would give my blessing uh, to you, your family, and to all of our viewers, may Almighty God bless you with a love of justice, a concern for those in need, and a willingness to give of yourself that our Lord himself bestows upon us. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Uh, Nadia, so much for being with us and for your service and the service of the rest of your family living and uh, dead. God bless you all. Thank you.